Welcome to part two of three of the Sick Kid Murder series. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I recommend going back and listening before continuing this episode. The series of episodes contains a graphic depiction of infant deaths, medical terminology, and descriptions of autopsies that may disturb some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. In the last episode, I mentioned baby Justin Cook's death was the one that triggered a full police investigation. It wasn't because he was another baby that died on the ward so soon after the others. It was more disturbing than that. 14-week-old Justin was the last baby to die on Ward 4A on March 22, 1981, in relation to the suspected baby murders. He was a sick little boy. He was born with his heart on his right side of his body and a defect which made it difficult for the blood to get to his lungs. He was admitted on the evening of March 20th, 1981 and was scheduled for surgery to place a shunt on March 22nd. He was catheterized upon admission in preparation for the surgery. He did well after that procedure, but at around 6 p.m. he suffered what was called a blue spell. A blue spell is when the heart starts to contract intensely and causes a lack of oxygen, making the baby appear blue. This can be life-threatening, but he was treated with the drug propranolol to reduce the contractions. His condition improved, but was monitored constantly by nurses. He seemed to be doing completely fine until 3.45 a.m. the morning of March 22nd, when he suddenly became slightly blue and began having a seizure. His doctor was called and he was given another dose of propranolol, but it didn't seem to be helping little Justin. He continued to look blue and was having trouble breathing. Another dose was given and he had a slight response, but then his heart rate dipped severely. Atropine and morphine were delivered. His heart rate continued to go up and down. At 4.20 a.m., after he was getting ready to be transferred to the ICU, His heart rate plummeted, went into ventricular fibrillation, and went into cardiac arrest. They attempted to resuscitate him, but weren't able to do so, and he was pronounced dead just over 25 minutes later at 4.56 a.m. At first glance, his death doesn't seem that odd. He was extremely sick, and the chance of him dying from his condition was fairly high. Since there were a few suspicious deaths already on the wards, and the intending doctor was aware of this, he decided to take an anti-mortem blood sample from Justin at 4.30 a.m., as well as a post-mortem sample and a sample from the IV fluid bag somewhere between 5 and 6 a.m., The result from the anti-mortem blood sample revealed toxic digoxin levels, just like the other children. Here lies the strange part. Justin was never on digoxin. In fact, the drug was contraindicated for his condition, meaning if given this medication, it would have worsened his condition, not improved it. The post-mortem sample also revealed high levels of digoxin. The sample was sent to three different labs to make sure there was not an error in the mathematics or testing at sick kids. All results came back as positive for high levels of the drug. The IV fluid was tested as well, but tested negative. Tissue samples were tested and all came back as positive for toxic levels. In autopsy, cause of death was deemed to be from toxic levels of digoxin. Once the fact was known, a memo was sent out to halt all elective admissions for all babies to be tested for digoxin on the ward, and then for all the babies to be transferred to other units so the nursing staff on duty could be dismissed for the foreseeable future. During the inquiry, experts could not agree on Justin's cause of death. They attempted to explain it away by saying it could have been a medical error. This was also immediately dismissed as that was nearly impossible. The drug Justin was given, propranolol, was checked by a nurse who placed it at his bedside for quick access. It was then checked by the doctor before it was given. It would have had to have been on a crash cart, which it was deemed earlier there wasn't any digoxin on any crash cart in the wards a few days prior. 
Also, it would have had to have been an adult vial on the cart to account for the levels found in the autopsy. Another doctor testified that it was not possible for the mistake to happen during the resuscitation efforts either. Levels distributed from the blood to the tissues would suggest the dose was given at approximately 3.30 a.m. and no medication was recorded at this time. Another doctor agreed Justin could have been given an unauthorized dose of digoxin, but also could have had a fatal blue spell before any toxic reaction to the drug could have occurred. Once the nursing staff was dismissed, the police were notified and given the details on Justin's death, as well as the other deaths in relation to digoxin toxicity. Police took action almost immediately, and only five days go by after Justin's death before an arrest was made. Susan Nellis was arrested at her home on March 27, 1981, after requesting legal counsel when police came to interview her. I'll go more in depth into the investigation on Susan Ellis in the next episode. Police started an investigation into the suspicious deaths and traced back the first death to Laura Woodcock, who passed on June 30th, 1980. They discovered a total of 43 suspicious deaths between June 1980 and March 1981, ending with Justin Cook. There were 36 infant deaths that were heavily investigated, all babies ranging from 9 days old to 11 months old, and some of whom were expected to improve and eventually be released. All of the babies suffered heart failure, couldn't be resuscitated, and died as a result. It was originally argued that the babies coming into these wards were extremely sick, and it isn't uncommon for multiple infants to die as a result of their condition. Taking this into account, police obtained records of all deaths from the wards for a time frame of nine months the year before and the year after. So between January 1979 and September 1979, there were five reported deaths. In the next nine-month span between October 1979 and June 1980, there were six deaths, including Laura Woodcock. During the period in question, July 1980 and March 1981, there were 34 recorded deaths. And in the following nine-month period, there was only one recorded death. This revealed a 625% increase in deaths during the period in question in comparison. The hospital continued to attempt to explain it away by saying they had sicker children coming into the hospital during that time frame, but the numbers spoke for themselves. Also, coincidentally or not, the death stopped after the procedural change was made for a unit dose system for dispensing drugs was put into place after Justin Cook's death. I would like now to go a little deeper into a few of the infant deaths that were the most suspicious, starting with one-year-old Antonio Velasquez. He was brought into the hospital from St. Lucia to undergo surgery to fix a septal defect in his heart. Doctors deemed his condition as low risk for death and expected to improve from surgery. He was admitted to the hospital on August 19th, and on August 21st, he had a successful surgery, followed by being transferred to Ward 4A on August 22nd for recovery and was due to be sent back home to St. Lucia. During his stay, Antonio received two doses of digoxin during the first two days of admission, but it was then discontinued. The following day, August 23rd, the baby developed a fever and tachycardia, which is fast heart rate. Fearing this may be an infection from the surgery, the baby was given codeine to ease his distress, which seemed to help. Antonio was stable through the rest of the evening, even with the fever and tachycardia. Early into the morning of August 24th, his condition started to deteriorate. He became unresponsive and bradycardic. Thinking it was the effects from the codeine administered earlier, he was given naloxone, also known as Narcan, to offset the effects of the codeine. If you don't already know, naloxone is used in opioid overdoses to reverse the effects. In error, a double dose was given. At first, it looked like Antonio was responding well, but since he still wasn't fully responsive, another dose of Narcan was given. Again, twice the recommended dose, five minutes later, which is standard procedure. 
Almost instantly after the second dose, at 3.20 a.m., he suffered cardiac arrest and couldn't be resuscitated and was pronounced dead at 4.20 a.m. His doctors were disturbed about his death. It was unexpected and opposite to what was anticipated. At first, they were concerned the death was due to an overdose of naloxone, but that was dismissed due to the wide safety margin. It would have been almost impossible to overdose a baby enough to injure him, let alone cause death. An autopsy was performed. The coroner advised the shunt was in place and there were no sign of infection, and the coding levels were within therapeutic range. Cause of death was noted as undetermined. Digoxin levels were not measured at this time or before death occurred. Upon reviewing this case at the Grange Inquiry, all of the experts could agree the death was unexpected and inconsistent with Antonio's medical condition, but all couldn't agree on what the cause of death could be. Some thought it was a result of the adverse effects of codeine. Some thought it was consistent with digoxin overdose. As you'll see, the common theme through all of these cases is the experts not being able to agree on a cause of death, whether that be by digoxin toxicity or not. The next death I'd like to explore more is that of 10-day-old Stephanie Lombardo. She was also a sick little girl and was admitted from the day she was born on December 13, 1980. She had a heart defect that caused not enough blood to get to her lungs and was awaiting surgery to attempt to correct this. She originally was admitted to the neonatal unit due to her age and had a cardiac catheter placed there two days after her birth. At age four days, she underwent surgery to have a shunt placed. The operation was successful. Stephanie spent five days in the ICU recovering and then was taken to Ward 4A on December 22nd. Since the shunt that was placed was a bit abnormal, there was concern it may have been too big, and heparin was prescribed to prevent any clotting and closing of the shunt. Doctors were also slightly concerned about her oxygenation because she was slightly blue unless she was resting, where her color did return to normal. She received supplemental oxygen, which was discontinued the next morning as she was improving. Otherwise, she was stable and responding well. I'd like to mention here that Stephanie was never prescribed digoxin. In fact, it may have been contraindicated due to her condition. Through the evening of the 22nd, she remained stable and was feeding well. She continued receiving heparin via IV through a pump that regulated the medication. She wasn't prescribed anything else at the time. In the early hours of December 23rd, around 3.20 a.m., it was noted that she suddenly became bradycardic, had an irregular heartbeat and shallow breathing. She was immediately hooked up to a cardiac monitor. Her coloring started to deteriorate and her limbs became blue. Not long after, she vomited and went into cardiac arrest at 3.45 a.m. She was unable to be revived and the time of death was noted at 4.20. An autopsy was not performed. Her cause of death was deemed as an occlusion of the shunt. Her body was exhumed for the purposes of the inquiry in February 1982. Once the tests were completed on the exhumed tissues, it was shockingly found she had substantial amounts, some of the highest level the coroner has ever found, of digoxin. Seven different tissue samples were tested multiple different ways to ensure the outcome was correct. Once again, experts tried to explain it away by saying it could have been given an error during resuscitation efforts or in the days before her death, but those theories were quickly shot down. It would have been impossible for the dose, even an error, to account for the levels found. Also, there wasn't any indication of digoxin toxicity until she started to fail. In addition, there were fewer patients and fewer staffs on duty that evening due to the holidays, so there should have been less confusion, not more, on both medication error and medical error. Unfortunately, because of the deterioration of the body by the time it was exhumed, the doctors couldn't rule out the cause of death being occlusion of the shunt, but they could all agree her death was sudden and unexpected, and her cause of death was consistent with digoxin toxicity. Some experts testified it was a probable cause of death, while others said it was a possible cause of death. The fact of the matter is, this child was not prescribed or given digoxin while she was in the hospital. So why did they find such high levels in a child who supposedly never received the drug? 
like Justin Cook, it couldn't be explained. Even worse, these two cases weren't the only ones of digoxin being found when not prescribed. I'll go more into that case, but first I'd like to go into more detail about the death of Janice Estrella. Four-month-old Janice Estrella had a lot of medical issues. She was born with Down syndrome, also born with a septum between her right and left ventricles, and instead of having two valves between the atria and ventricles, she only had one. As a result of her heart defects, too much blood was pumped into the pulmonary artery, and the blood passing into the aorta wasn't completely oxygenated. She was admitted for surgery on December 14, 1980. She had a rough go after surgery. Her right lung partially collapsed, but by December 28th, she was stabled and transferred to Ward 4A. She still wasn't feeding properly and had a nasogastric tube, also known as a feeding tube, and there were intermittent signs of heart failure. She was having issues with nutrition and was put on antibiotics due to suspicion of nematis or inflammation of the lungs. Janice was receiving digoxin until January 7th, when it was put on a hold order after she became bradycardic. The only medication given between then and January 10th was fromicide to counteract possible renal impairment, of which she was also showing signs of. By January 10th, Janice was stable. There were no signs of heart failure or heart rate irregularity. Although she was still fairly ill and on constant nursing care, she was doing well through the day and into the evening. Into the early morning hours of January 11th, at approximately 2.40 a.m., Janice started going downhill. The nurse on duty noticed she was gasping for air. Respiratory rate was extremely low, and when listening for a heart rate, little could be heard. The cardiac arrest team was initiated, but it was too late. She could not be resuscitated, and time of death was announced at 3.22 a.m. Janice's case was a unique one in the sense that her death was recorded at the hospital as being reported to the coroner, but there wasn't a record of her death at the coroner's office. No autopsy under the supervision of the coroner was completed, but instead was conducted by Dr. Taylor, who was a resident pathologist at the time, and overseen by Dr. Manser, senior pathologist. Only a final autopsy report could be found in her charts, but there should have been an interim report, which is prepared immediately after the autopsy, as well as a final report after all toxicology results come back. What that final report did state was the surgery was still intact, no other reason for heart failure other than the repaired congenital heart abnormality. Postmortem samples of digoxin were taken. It was stated they were contaminated by edema fluid, and the sample's red levels that were strikingly elevated, and if they were accurate, would account for her cause of death. Seems pretty cut and dry, right? Sure, she was on digoxin for most of her life, but that wouldn't account for the extremely high toxic levels found. There's a little more to the post-mortem sample procedure in this particular case. Dr. Taylor testified he was instructed to take these samples. There was not any reason given other than the hospital struggled with her levels. Dr. Taylor forgot about the instruction and didn't take it before the autopsy started. Him and a colleague went back to the morgue and took a blood sample from the leg vein and pelvic cavity. If he did this before autopsy as he was supposed to, it would have been taken from the superior vena cava, but since the autopsy was completed, he was unable to do that. The reason there was a sample taken from the pelvic cavity as well was because Dr. Taylor didn't think he obtained a large enough sample from the leg vein. The samples were taken separately to the lab to be tested. The results from the leg vein came back as elevated, and the results from the pelvic cavity sample came back as extremely high. It was discussed and concluded the readings must have been due to a math error or contamination. Dr. Taylor was instructed to go follow up with the lab about the readings, but he never did. He did report the findings to Dr. Manser, who concluded with the last paragraph of the autopsy report that the child died by digoxin toxicity. (music) 
At the preliminary hearing, it was confirmed the test results were accurate and valid, and the judge concluded the baby was murdered by an overdose of digoxin. At first, all experts agreed she did die by digoxin toxicity, but during the inquiry, they changed their tune, suggesting the sample was contaminated by fecal matter. Experiments were completed on 26 samples of quote-unquote gutter blood from the pelvis from 14 patients. Out of all of those, only one came back as a false positive with high level of digoxin. They stated from that one false reading, faith was lost on Janice's high reported number. Another doctor took these findings as more validity for Janice's high levels, and in the end, all of the experts once again couldn't agree on the cause of death. The final death I'd like to explore more is that of 20-day-old Jordan Hines. Unlike the others, Jordan was doing well at home. His mother brought him into the doctor after he was found choking and coughing in his crib. The doctor didn't find anything wrong with him at that time, said he was gaining weight and doing well. Later that same day, Jordan had a spell of shallow breathing and his color wasn't great. Even though he was alert and responding, his parents didn't like the fact that he seemed to be struggling to breathe and his color was poor. So they took him to their local hospital in North York General that evening. Through the evening, Jordan had a few more episodes of shallow breathing and some bouts of his breathing completely stopping. At North York General, he was given the diagnosis of sick sinus syndrome with bradycardia and tachycardia, probably due to some congenital heart disease. It's noted in the inquiry that sick sinus syndrome was never actually explained and couldn't be found in any medical dictionaries to be defined at that time. Basically, the sinus node acts as the heart's natural pacemaker. It regulates the heart rate appropriate for the body's needs. Sick sinus syndrome is the heart's inability to regulate the rate properly. He was referred and transferred to sick kids at around midnight on March 5th, 1981. He was examined there and was originally thought to have an infection or possible sepsis, and antibiotics were prescribed. They did a number of tests on his heart, which came back as structurally normal, and the culture for sepsis came back negative. The next day, March 6th, he had a few episodes of apnea, but was stable. On both March 7th and 8th, there were no reports of any distress with the baby. Vital signs were normal, and he didn't have a fever. The attending doctor wasn't concerned with his condition and reported Jordan was stable when he left for the night, which was somewhere between 1 to 2 a.m. on March 8th. About an hour later, Jordan vomited, fed again, and went back to sleep. Another hour later, at around 4 a.m., his cardiac and apnea monitor suddenly went crazy. He was unresponsive and went into cardiac arrest. CPR was started. A normal rhythm came back only to be followed by bradycardia, and after an exhausting few hours, he was pronounced dead at 6.43 a.m. Of course, an autopsy was performed. This child's death was certainly sudden and unexpected. The autopsy found no heart abnormalities, no infection, and did see signs of chronic hypoxia. He also saw signs associated with Miss SIDS, or sudden infant death syndrome. The doctor who performed the autopsy was known as the world-renowned expert in the field of SIDS. But that doesn't explain the heart issues Jordan died from. The cause of death on the final autopsy report was not really an answer. It quoted query SIDS which would make one think the doctor was questioning whether or not he was 100% sure of the final cause of death. When questioned on this, he said he was certain it was SIDS and wasn't really concerned with the arrhythmias, but could agree something could have caused the disruption in the conduction system of the heart leading to his death. So even though he said he was certain it was SIDS, his answer was wishy-washy at best. I'd like to note here that Jordan's blood and tissues were not tested for digoxin at the time of autopsy. The body was exhumed on December 8, 1981, just before the preliminary hearing at the request of Jordan's father. His son's death didn't sit right with him. All of his tissues were tested and all came back positive for digoxin. The tissues came back with therapeutic and near toxic ranges, but the fact that they came back positive at all was extremely concerning. Like the other two cases where digoxin wasn't prescribed but found in samples, the doctor tried explaining it away as a medical error. As I spoke about earlier, Jordan was only given 
two antibiotics, both of which would have been nearly impossible to confuse with digoxin, especially with one of the antibiotics due to it being in powdered form that needed to be diluted in solution. It was concluded a medical error was highly unlikely. It's also important to know that even if a dose was given an error, a maintenance dose would not account for the levels found. During the inquiry, the experts came up with three possible causes of death. One, SIDS. Two, sick sinus syndrome. Three, digoxin toxicity. Mostly all could agree his outcome was consistent with digoxin toxicity, but once again, could not all fully agree on cause of death. One thought it was unlikely it would be SIDS as he was under 30 days old. Another thought his death was expected and in line with his condition. Another advised sick sinus syndrome rarely ends in death, and a few thought it was in line with digoxin toxicity. So once again, no one could agree, even with the presence of digoxin, which should not have been there. So you just heard the details of five baby deaths from Ward 4A. If this wasn't enough to convince you something fishy was going on, there was a list of three common features of the deaths in the period in question created. The first being almost all patients suffered an onset of symptoms that led to cardiac arrest and eventually death. This happened too quickly for the babies to be transferred to the ICU. The next is the time of death. 25 out of the 34 deaths in question occurred between 12 a.m. and 6 a.m. 24 of those occurring between 1 and 5 a.m. The team present was another common feature. There were four teams per ward, so eight in total. No more than one team or team members to be on duty for more than 25% of the time, so the deaths should have been evenly spaced out between all four teams. This wasn't the case. The onset of critical symptoms for all but one of the 36 deaths took place while one or more team members of a particular team were on duty in either ward. Even when the few odd deaths that didn't occur between 12 and 6 a.m. Hospital staff thought it was because the babies being brought into the particular ward were younger and sicker, which would account for the increase in deaths. Also try to explain it away by saying there was a shortage of night nursing staff, but upon investigation, there was no evidence of that. Another excuse they came up with was an increase of seriously ill babies being referred to and admitted to the hospital from Winnipeg. That theory wasn't viable as there was only one baby that died that was from Winnipeg. Multiple qualified doctors with extraordinary credentials reviewed the significant increase in deaths during the period in question and concluded there was an increase which couldn't be ignored. But what was the cause? At first, medical error was considered as they do occur frequently in hospitals, but to suggest all of these deaths were due to medication administration error is ludicrous. Most of the deaths were in the middle of the night with one nursing team finding high levels of the same drug and occurring in the same ward. It's hard to conclude the deaths were because of an error. Also, an accidental overdose should occur even less at night. It's quieter, it's not as busy, and there are less distractions. In the end, all of the experts agreed if the babies did in fact die from a digoxin overdose, it would have had to been given no more than four hours before the onset of critical symptoms. With that in mind, no error associated with a regularly scheduled digoxin dose, which were only at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m., could have caused death in children with onset of symptoms after 1 a.m. and before 9 a.m. Most of the deaths occurred in this time frame. On the final episode of Sick Kid Murders, I'll be diving into the investigation, the arrest and release of Susan Ellis, an outlandish alternative explanation that came out in 2011, a wrap-up of the case itself, and my final thoughts. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I know it was a lot of information to take in. As always, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please go rate and review on Apple Podcasts. If you're not already, go follow me at Cold Canada Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. You can find Cold Canada on your preferred podcast platform. Just search Cold Canada on Solve Murders or follow the link in the episode notes. This has been part two of three of Sick Kid Murders. My name is Heather Curran and this has been Cold Canada. Mm-hmm.